Hello, friends. It's delightful to see you again. Welcome back to the Gallery of Curiosities. I'm once again your humble host and caretaker, Leopold. The Gallery needed some cleaning recently, and although I love a good dusting, I thought it best to hire someone to help tidy up a bit, so I made a Faustian bargain. I traded away my soul for a good, thorough house cleaning. After all, I wasn't using it. The thing is, now the devil is mad at me. He came back and said, The soul you sold me is twisted, bent, soiled, and broken. I just pointed to the no returns sign. A good deal is hard to find, especially when you're bartering with otherworldly entities. As with tonight's exhibit, Within My Reach... Born to immigrants in British Columbia, the author, Ola Alfeta, has strongly connected to the merging of different worlds from the moment she arrived into this one. All her stories reflect this to some degree. Her other short story, The Grand Museum, has appeared in The Future Fire, presenting... Within My Reach by Ola al Fateh. All monsters are elusive, some more so than others. None of them, however, are secretive about their existence. People know about them because of the flyers glued to the walls of train stations, town squares, hookah taverns. In those notices, the monsters describe what they want and what they promise. To give back. Come to the lake, one advertisement says, for I dwell at the bottom of it. Do not bring a net but your bare hands. Walk into the waters, catch me, and you shall earn apprenticeship. This is only for the nimble and the quick-witted. Go to the tallest gas lamp in 34th Street, another advertisement says, for inside the lamp is where I live. I will make you a respected worker only if you climb to the top of the post without a ladder and blow out the candle inside. Only the robust shall earn this position. Wait for the approaching thunderstorm, a third advertisement says, and look at the sky. You will see me when it lights up. Remember my face and you shall earn good money for good work. I only employ the patient and the attentive. The least elusive monster lives in the forest by the park. It never leaves the clearing but always waits for someone to trade with. All barterers are welcome, no matter who they might be. They are sure to have something valuable which the monster will swap for a fortune's worth of gold coins. It says so in its advertisement, The forest glade is where I'll be. Go there after the sun sleeps, for that's when I will awaken. Give what I ask, and gold is what I shall deliver. As dusk falls, a bargainer arrives to the park at the edge of the forest. She stops to straighten the frilly shoulder straps of her apron draped over her long dress tightens the string of her bonnet beneath her square chin. Bless the gold giver for wanting to meet at sundown, the young lady muses. She hadn't managed to wash out all the grime and soot from her clothes, but they shouldn't be so conspicuous in the dark, even with the lantern in her hand. Monsters always expect neatness from the humans that come to them, and she hopes to look presentable, for the one she's about to meet. 
This morning, she read the advertisement when she was sweeping the cobblestones at the train station, searching specifically for a monster that demanded neither talent nor discipline. She certainly didn't have the former, and was beginning to run out of the latter. Finding a monster that simply gave gold for a small price seemed almost too good to be true. It was too good to be true, if her friends and remaining family were to be believed. Earlier today, a friend said, I've heard things, I've heard of something that happened to this reckless young man from the Near East. He was a newlywed without any money and so he sought the creature out. The monster told him to go into the cave by the lookout, to pick up a rock from inside and to bring it back to the clearing. Of course, the poor fool laughed and trotted right into the cave. He never came out again, but a bear with blood on its claws did. Later, the gold coins were found in his father's snuff box. Oh, you must give this more thought before you make such a decision. In reply, the young lady shook her head in a snapping motion and said, I've given this thought and I've made my decision. I need the money badly and this is the quickest way to get it. Soon after that conversation, a cousin told her, A daft blacksmith went along in the forest, prepared to give the wretched thing whatever it asked for, the thing that just so happened to want the blacksmith's daughter. He shed tears and begged to give the monster something else, anything else, but the monster refused. So the blacksmith went to the graveyard and dug his daughter out from her resting place. As he carried her body over his shoulders and went back on his way to the monster, the police arrested and hanged the dunderhead before he could set foot in the forest again. Later, as they prepared the daughter's second burial, they found the gold pieces inside her ears and behind her eyes. You mustn't go to the thing in the forest. This supposed gold giver relies on the half-wits who see nothing past their noses. There are a million paths, there are a million monsters. Why should you settle for this one? The young lady slapped the arms of her chair, stood up and said, I can't stand to live another day like this. I've spent too many years out in the searing heat and in the bitter cold cleaning this town's filth all for a meagre sum to buy myself a few scraps of food, a single dress and this pokey flat. I don't care what you say. I shall go to the forest anyhow. And so, having given this thought and having made her decision, she is here anyhow. She watches and listens. The trees are spidery black silhouettes against a horizon of opalescent blue clouds. The swings in the park hang still. No crow calls into the heavy air perfumed by the violets. Nothing splashes in the pond nearby. The silence is broken by her footfalls and the creaking of her lantern when she enters the forest. She walks the trail with one hand holding the lantern in front of her face. For a while, mosquitoes are her only company. Maddeningly, they whine and zoom around her. Sometimes she succeeds in slapping them and wiping the mush on her apron. As she goes downhill, the lantern in her outstretched hand swings in front of her. The circle of light sways up and down, then settles on a monster blocking her path. It's not the one she's looking for. It's rather small, standing at the height of her ankles and scuttles around on eight black, angular legs surveys her with the round, empty sockets, grins with clenched teeth from a face of pure white bone. It has a human skull for a body and walks on spider legs, but she is not afraid because it's small and it's smiling. But its sudden appearance makes her shift back. Another one.
the little creature says. Its mandibles don't move when it speaks, but she knows the voice belongs to it. She can't tell whether it's talking to her, or to itself, or both, but she answers anyway. Aye, aye, the young lady flicks her hand, dismissing the creature. If you wouldn't mind. Once more, she's not afraid of the little thing, but she also doesn't want to try stepping over it to get past. The thing in the clearing does not wish you any good, the creature says. It makes a movement which the barterer assumes is a shaking head, as well as such a gesture could be made without a neck or shoulders. Do you mean the one who bargains? The creature appears to nod its head. That monster, does she lie when she says she delivers gold? That's what she's most afraid of. It has no use for lying, the little creature says. Only the fearful lie. And the monster has no reason to fear anything that comes its way. It also has no fear of losing potential bargainers. It knows that many will come to it, no matter what. It doesn't even have a reason to hide what it wants in return for the commodity it promises. It only enjoys surprising its hagglers when it makes its request. She furrows her brow in bafflement, then kneels down, putting her lantern down beside her. And what does she want in return? she asks. It's different every time the little creature replies, and it's never pleasant to see what happens when it takes what it wants. Does she send you away to the predatory beasts? Does she demand for you to dig up bones to bring to her? I'm forbidden to divulge. You should return home. The barterer stands up, picks up her lantern and looks at the trail behind her, thinks about leaving the forest and returning home to tell her family and friends how she quit. She thinks about them patting her shoulder and saying, you did the right thing. She thinks about waking up tomorrow morning and travelling by foot to the train station to sweep ashes, bottles and apple cores again. There is no room in her mind for other monsters to meet or for anything beyond that. There is only room for two possible outcomes, sweeping the train station or meeting the monster in the clearing. Kindly step aside, she says, turning her gaze back to the creature. I want to get there fast, or perhaps you should stay where you are. I might like to pick you up and throw you away. She has no intention of picking the creature up, nor of throwing it away, but will say anything to make the creature leave. Under oath, says the Crimea, I cannot end your journey. It scurries away into a pile of leaves. She goes along her way, more excited than afraid to meet this monster, since it sounds so interesting from what everyone has said about it, until another monster stops her. It is actually an abundance of monsters fused into one, their base a trunk with roots burrowing into the dirt. They hold her by the ankle with a tree root from the ground, towering wooden creatures that regard everything with their tubular iridescent eyes from narrow faces with drooping maws, barren twigs topping their heads. They make expressions of anguish, but they speak in a collective, melodic voice, not unlike a symphony of glass harps. We urge you not to continue, the creatures say. She doesn't answer, but only tugs against their grip. When that doesn't work, she lowers her lamp next to their base and opens the little mantle. The light intensifies, as does the heat. I urge you to let me go, she says. 
she starts to tip the lamp over. She doesn't actually intend to burn the monsters, but hopes she'll scare them into releasing her. We shall in a moment, they say. When you show that you understand what we say, this is not the path you should take. I shall leave this place only if it turns out that there is no monster there the young lady says, and I know she's there. She points to the path she came from. Your wee friend told me so. This is not what we mean, the creatures say. We know the monster promises wealth on the condition of payment. No one has failed to pay the price, and it has never failed to deliver its promise, but you may still never get it. How do you mean, she demands. This time their collective voice matches the sorrowful expressions on their faces. That we cannot tell you, and we also cannot stop you, interrupt you, but not stop you, advise you, but not stop you. Return to your world now. If you go further, you may never leave here. And why wouldn't I? That we cannot tell you. The root around her ankle uncoils and wriggles back into the ground. She picks up her lamp and takes the stepping stones across the stream, where she slips with a gasp and drops her lamp. It crashes and disappears into the rushing water. She trudges out of the stream, gritting her teeth, bearing the cold, damp skirts around her legs as she holds her hands out in front of her. She walks like this across the trail of dirt and tree roots until her footsteps are muffled by a lush pasture of grass. She sees the monster resting in the clearing. It lies on its stomach with its jagged pincers twitching in front of its multitude of blank, bulbous eyes. When the creature becomes aware of its visitor, four segmented legs grow out from the sides of its body and lift the creature up to stand at the height of an ox. The young lady pays little attention to its size and prehensile pincers, but cannot stop herself from gawking at the shapes squirming all over the creature's flat back. The monster does not come to her, but waits for her, and so she takes a breath and marches to it, trying to ignore the moving shapes on the creature's back. When she stops ten feet from it, The monster says, My children want eyes. Despite herself, she looks back to the squirming eyes. She bites her lower lip to keep herself from screaming at the shifting mass of vaguely human faces on the creature's back. She is somewhat grateful for dropping her lantern along the way, as there is no light to help her see them fully. She can still see that some of them have eyes, eyes without light and without a sign of blinking, not quite fitting into their sockets. The ones without eyes are more restless. She knows then that the monster is not speaking in riddles. They want both of them, she stammers. Both of them. Her eyes itch as she imagines losing them. To reassure herself and to remind the monster that she has control of her situation, she looks directly at the creature's black eyes and states, If I give ye what you want, ye shall give me what I want, tit for tat, butter for fat. If ye kill me, dog, I shall kill your cat. She says the last line even though she's sure the monster doesn't have a cat and even if it did, it probably wouldn't mind so much if its cat were killed. You will never be poor again, the monster says. 
Once the gold is in your hands, you will have all the money to last you a lifetime. Her heart is crawling up her throat, down her stomach and up her throat again. Her feet quake in the grass and it's not just because of her cold, wet skirt. She turns away from the monster and fights the urge to cover her eyes. If she is about to give them up, she wants to use them as much as she can for the last time. She keeps her back turned, not wanting the demon to be the last thing she sees. No moon or star looms in the sky, but she doesn't want to miss a single ruffle of the blackening clouds. The view is blurred when her eyes brim with tears, as though in farewell, before she snaps them closed and the tears roll down her cheeks. When they're closed, it's easier to imagine what will happen after the ordeal is done. She imagines the heavy, iron coolness in her palms, She won't get to see the gold coins glimmer, but she's certain they will be there. Her eyes pop open. Loudly she says, I shall take ye riches, and ye shall take my eyes. The monster flies at her from behind, its hard forelegs landing on her shoulders. She shields her eyes. Fangs pierce her hands, forcing them away. Each pincer stabs each lid. She screams and screams and screams, but she does not fight. The screams stop. As blood runs down her face and drips into the grass, she falls to her knees, sobbing and coughing. The shock subsides. It's not as though she can't see anything. She knows this sight. She used to see this when she once had eyes to close. Her trembling fists clutch the grass. She turns in circles, patting the space around them, feeling only grass and dew. A long time passes, but she doesn't stop searching. Meanwhile, just above her, hanging by the string from an overlooking tree branch, is a velvet pouch heavy with 50 gold coins. The monster sits at the edge of the glade, watching her. She will never even think to reach it, it says to itself. She will go on grovelling for it on the ground, forever thinking that a few more thousand rounds will help her find it. Convinced that the gold giver has buried the coins beneath the ground, the young lady stabs her fingers into the grass and rips at the earth, digging and digging and digging. Then she eases herself to her feet. For a moment, she simply stands with her hands at her sides, her bonnet hanging loosely from the back of her head. Even in sleep, she has never been this motionless. She tries to decide where to go, After a lifetime of brash, rigid decisions, she lingers in the glade and realises she can't decide. Without any idea of where it will take her, she lifts one foot in front of the other and goes forward. With her mind as murky as her vision, her tentative steps become scampers. She runs with her hands stretched out in front of her face, a pale oval shape sullied with blood and marred by twin holes at the top, a maw gaping near the bottom. Her hands snatch at the air and will not stop until they have found something. Soon, they do. She closes her fingers around an object. Though panicked and desperate, she's clear-minded enough to realise it's not the gold coins. Gold coins are not bulbous nor fragile. Gold coins are neither moist nor veiny. Finally, with few exceptions, gold coins do not cause screams when picked up. The gold giver, having consistently cheated a thousand humans, has never anticipated a victim fighting back. And so, when this blind barterer claws at its children, the monster freezes in awe, 
listening to the shrills delivered from a dozen mouths. It hears wet snapping sounds beneath the screams, snap, snap. The young lady staggers backwards, gripping a spherical object in each hand. The creature watches her pop the objects into her own bleeding sockets. Squelch, squelch. She blinks and slaps the side of her head to make the objects fit. Her new eyes stare back at the creature. One is brown, the other one hazel. Assailant! The monster hollers, its voice a hiss beneath the wails resonating from the contorting faces on its back. My eye! She took my eye! One of the children screams. Make her give it back! Screams another. Mother! Mother! I want my eye back! But the barterer has turned around and bolted, disappeared into the forest surrounding the glade. Swallowed by the trees and the shadows, her bonnet flying off her head and trailing behind her. As the cold night air vibrates with the screams of its children, the gold giver charges. With its front pincers, it tears its way through the trees. Up ahead, it sees the barterer running with her skirts hitched up, the thorns from the passing bushes cutting her calves. The monster runs with twice as many legs, but it doesn't reach her. Midway through the forest, it halts, watching the young lady splash across the river, sprint down the trail, stumble, fall, scramble to her feet, reach the edge of the forest and shrink into the horizon. It knows nothing about the world outside of the forest. It barely knows anything about the park nearby. And though its children are screaming, the monster won't tread further. It stares at the path, though it doesn't see the barterer anymore. When she's sure she's lost the monster, the young lady halts beside a lamp post, with one gashed hand resting on the pole and another planted on her heaving chest. She takes slow, deep breaths. She looks around at the empty, dimly lit street, wipes the sweat off her forehead. After her escape, going back to get the gold is of course out of the question, but she hasn't left the forest with nothing. With one hazel eye and one brown eye, she sees that the street is as dirty as it was this morning, but she doesn't think of going back to her routine of cleaning it like she would of with her old set of eyes. There are other places to go, as her new visions show her, places she had never surmised before. People she never knew existed but would like to meet. Tasks she's never done or thought she could. Whatever shall happen, it shall all be in my hands, she thinks to herself, bloodied though my hands may be. The first path she takes is home. Years later, many will claim to have seen the young lady return to their village. They will claim to have seen her dead and dim eyes that didn't fit their sockets, that each beheld a different facet of reality, and together they formed one multifaceted gaze, showing her possibilities she never dreamed of before. In another village, there will also be rumours of how the young lady never actually left the glade, that she died searching on the ground for the gold coins. There will be tales of how the forces of the forest kept her alive to grovel in the grass for years until she finally thought to reach up and grab the pouch from above, only to die from age before she could pour the coins into her wizened hands. Some other denizens from different villages will claim to have seen her hobble back into the village, smiling with the corners of her lips trembling, a gold coin glinting from each eye socket. To this day, the monster is still in the glade, and it will have more barterers.
Bartering for what one truly wants is often difficult. A vampire friend of mine wanted to enter a special exhibit we had set up in the gallery. A hall of mirrors. Despite the fact that a vampire would surely find the experience disappointing, I granted him access. He had no money, however, so instead he offered me a fine coffin. I said, My dear fellow, a coffin is the last thing I'll need. Our reader this evening was Michael Whitehouse, who is a writer, filmmaker, and voiceover artist from Glasgow, Scotland. He spends most of his time writing supernatural fiction, though occasionally dabbles in other genres when the story leads him there. He's also the founder of Ghastly Tales, which has both a horror fiction podcast and YouTube channel. And now, friends, to send you off with one of my favorite traditional toasts. To good friends who know you well, but like you anyway. Gallery of Curiosities is produced under a Creative Commons International 4.0 non-commercial attribution, no derivatives license. Story copyrights remain with the authors. Music was sourced from filmmusic.io. This episode was produced in November of 2021. For full show notes, visit us on the web at gallerycurious.com. My uncle sold tombstones, but he was always running short of raw materials. Sometimes he would barter. A lot of the times, he would take things for granted.